A couple months ago, I made a game that looked like this. It's a platforming game where you can change colors and you can only land on platforms that match your color. If you're red, you can only land on a red block, and you'll probably have to switch colors midair in order to get there. A bunch of people in my game development class played this game, I showed it off in a video, and the response was amazing. People liked it. They wanted more levels and more colors, and so I knew that I had to keep making this game. I wanted to upgrade the scope, the art, the colors, the code, everything. But there was one small problem. I made this game using this little engine called Pico8. It is an 8-bit game engine that uses this programming language called Lua. Everything in this engine is 8-bit. The pixel art that you can do, the editor that you write the code in for, <laughs> for whatever reason is also 8-bit. There's also an 8-bit level editor that I didn't know existed until afterwards, so I programmed every platform in my game manually with coordinates. Uh, there's just, uh, there's a lot of bumps that I ran into when I was using Pico 8 for this game. Definitely some skill issue on my end, but nonetheless, I knew that if I was gonna bring this color platforming game to the next level, I had to choose a different engine. The emotional damage was, it was just too strong. There are a lot of game development engines out there, and at this point I've tried them all at least a little bit. There's Unity, which is, I think, the most common, probably indie game development engine. Unreal, which is really good for heavy graphics, but that wasn't quite what I was doing. Game Maker, my beloved that I've done most of my stuff in and would probably be my natural choice. But then there's Godot the open source rising phenomenon that my university happened to be teaching a class in. A class taught by none other than Jonas Wills. Uh, who's that, you ask? Oh, uh, you know, just, um, just one of the original creators of Dragon Veil. When he dropped that news to the class, we were all just sitting there like, Oh my goodness. It was one of the most best-selling mobile games, and that was before mobile games really even took off. Anyway, I took his class last semester, not really knowing what to expect, but the whole thing was taught in Godot. So I knew off rip that one of my goals was to recreate my color game in this class, but first I had to learn how to actually use the engine. Godot is an interesting engine because everything is node-based. What that means is that everything in a game, the player, an object, a background, they're all nodes that are different types. Every type of node, and there's hundreds, they each have their own built-in logic and functionality that helps guide you to how to use it. For example, a player is usually going to be a kinematic body 2D node, since that comes with its own collision detection, and that's usually what you want when you're making a player. And that's completely different from something like a point light node that's going to help you get a light in your game. You still have to add a script to every node in order to tell it what to do, but it comes with its own parameters or attributes that'll just make that easier, depending on what it is. So as I, as I learned that system, I was able to make my first ever Godot game. It is, it is vertical, but... It is not a mobile game, okay? <laughs> Trust me. You control this little black blob. He's, he's a squid, perhaps. And you have to dodge these blocks that are coming in that'll progressively clump up more and more throughout the game. If you hit one of those, you die. But the longer you survive, the better you score. Pretty straightforward, you know, my next step is gonna be adding microtransactions and ads every time you get hit, but you know, that'll have to come later. I followed a written tutorial online in order to get this, cause those do exist, by the way. The more that I've followed tutorials like this, just throughout my whole game development journey, the more I've learned what does and doesn't work for me. Video tutorials, for whatever reason, just don't stick with me. I don't feel like I learn anything from them. And maybe you're in the same boat if you're always watching game development tutorials, but then you don't really feel like you remember any of it. There are incredibly well-made ones out there, but when I can actually follow written instructions through a written tutorial, I find that I just, I learn so much better. I'll link all the tutorials below, but this game was the first step towards finally eventually getting to my color game. After that, I made this rock climbing wizard platforming game that taught me how to make a good player controller that feels satisfying. I learned how lights work in Godot here and overall camera movement. Then came this cat game where you have to kill mice and then steal their cheese. I'm kind of whipping through all these projects, but for the record, they each took maybe one to two weeks. And they each taught us something completely different about Godot, which I think was the most useful part. My dream game, I guess you could say, of the color platformer wasn't gonna be anything like any of these games, but these were just the appetizers to the main course, you know? So after these projects and maybe half the semester or so, I felt like it was finally time. But I did have to do one last thing, and it was something truly, truly brilliant. Oh, uh, that's the name of today's sponsor. Brilliant. Brilliant is a lovely little platform that can make you better at math and computer science. It's a place for improving your technical skills that challenges you with active problem solving. Instead of telling yourself that you wish you were better at math so that you could get that engineering degree or impress that woman, 
you can actually do it with Brilliant. Because instead of just giving you a math problem like a textbook would, it's gonna actually help you through an engaging visual question. And there's a lot of variety to how you're learning. Let me show you. This is what a programming lesson might look like. You start by learning how to think like a programmer, how to work through logic and problem solve before you write any code. And by that point, you've been given the steps of how to succeed, so it's not as overwhelming as it would be if you were to just pull up a YouTube tutorial and try your best. Brilliant for me is pretty real because in the world of computer science, it's so easy to get imposter syndrome. It's really easy when things get hard to just feel like you're not meant for it or you're bad at it, but that's just not true. The reality is that everything is a skill and Brilliant can help you actually hone them in. So go ahead and click my amazing, incredible, sexy link to get 20% off your annual premium subscription. And that comes with a free 30-day free trial. Thank you so much, Brilliant, for sponsoring. And let's start making this game. The first thing that I had to tackle was just getting a basic platformer, but by this point I had <laughs> so much practice that that was light work. The next step just involved adding those color collisions and letting the player change colors. There were two ways that I could go about doing that. One is that I could have a bunch of different assets for each color that the player would be, which is how I did it the first time around in Pico 8. There was a red player sprite, a blue one, a green one, and they were all separate. But the problem with that is that I can't easily change any of the colors without going into my pixel art software and manually doing it. And it just takes up a lot of space, especially once I get more animations going. So the second way that I could handle the player color would be by doing it all in the game engine. Godot has this attribute called modulate that'll pretty much change the color of anything in your game. So for now, my player was just a white square and so were all the tiles, and then I would change them with code to actually determine the color. And this is great because in the future when I need accessibility settings, I could just literally give everyone a color wheel and maybe some patterns and they could change it themselves. But with all that in place, I had this system of jumping onto blocks and swapping colors with this little ring UI that I added. Every color is its own collision layer, so I'm easily able to just swap which ones are active based on what matches the player's color. After I did some testing, I found that the ring UI wasn't great, so I played around with a few different versions of the UI. Now, as incredible as these graphics were, I, I did want to upgrade them a little bit. I am a firm believer that you shouldn't do the art for your game until you're later in the process, because you can do the art whenever, so you might as well start with making the game fun. But because we were getting feedback on this in class, I kind of wanted something a little bit more polished. I knew that this was not going to be the final art, but I had a really fun time making it. I landed on this, like, really hand-drawn, goofy-looking style. The main character at this point was this little, uh, bipedal cat character. Throwing that in the game was definitely step two to making this feel better but there were still a lot of bugs in the game. If you ever switched colors while you were inside a block, you would just get stuck inside the block. In my Pico 8 version, I fixed this issue by just teleporting the player right above the block, but I could not get the same thing to happen here in Godot just because of how the collision system was. I tried and I tried time and time again to fix this issue and get the player to teleport, but I just, I could not do it. So I thought and I thought, and I remembered some of the most popular comments that you guys had left on the first video where I showed off this game. What if instead of teleporting out of a block, if you switch colors inside of it, you bounce out of it? And uh, you might think that that's like a really small change. That seems like more of a polish thing. Oh my goodness. This little feature somehow changed the entire direction, the feel, the genre of the entire game. Because now, if you really crank up the numbers on this bad boy and the player switches colors, they can bounce out of one platform into another, and if they conserve their momentum, they are, they are moving. This game used to be a slow, kind of thoughtful platformer, but now it has the potential to be a physics movement-based game. What if it's about how efficient you can get through a level by strategically swapping and flinging yourself around? And it's not just gonna be another speedrunning game because you still have to worry about correctly utilizing color. The more that I played this version of the game, the more that I realized I liked this a lot more. The original game was more about timing your jumps and really controlling your movement, but I found this version to be a lot more fun, and so did almost everybody else who playtested it. I've had the luxury of being able to have tons of people play this game in real life through my classes and watch them, which confirmed to me that this was the right direction. I, I can beat this in 75 seconds, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> I can totally do this. But playtesting did reveal an interesting dilemma, because not everybody liked it, obviously. And it's easy for the developer reaction on my end to be like, okay, let me make this more fun for more people so more people on average can enjoy it. But that's not always the right move. One thing that my professor Jonas taught us in this class is that a game made for everybody is a game made for nobody. Meaning that having a specific audience in mind and catering the game to be really enjoyable for them 
is infinitely better than trying to just appease as many people as possible. Because, spoiler alert, you are never going to be able to do that. So you might as well make a game that some people love and other people don't really like, then make something that's just equally fine to everybody? Think about hard games like Elden Ring. If the developers chose the difficulty based on the median experience level or the average player, then yeah, there would probably be less people complaining about it. But then there would also be less diehard fans who love how they overcame the challenge and got all the DLC and made content about it. Some people who played my game just didn't really intuitively understand the moving in the air while switching. But then other people, the same people who really like Celeste, Super Meat Boy or other speedy, visually rewarding platformers could feel it click and they really liked it. There, there's a movement tech in this. There's a movement yes, tech. There's a movement tech. <laughs> like you can actually launch yourself. That's gonna be the idea, but it's so hard to like I'm having trouble figuring out how I should introduce it of like, oh, this is a thing you can do. Just like Celeste Celeste. Did. I knew that I wanted to make this game primarily for them while of course adding optional elements to make it overall more accessible. Kind of like how Celeste is a really renowned hard game, but it still has options to make it easier. So all the mechanics that I focused on adding for this game enhanced the game for who my primary audience really was. I reworked the swapping UI and made the controls mouse-based, so you'd flick in one of the four directions and then that would turn the player a different color. That just worked a lot better with the whole speedrunning feel. I added a flow system where the more that you move and bounce without stopping, the faster that you'll go. And then this vignette matching your color kind of takes over the screen. It makes you feel like you're really locking in. And in the future, I know that I'll need to prioritize animations that are fluid and they really enhance the satisfaction of movement. And at this point, the game loop itself looked like this. Each level has a time and your goal is to get to the end in as little time as possible by using your momentum and swapping colors. It was a good structure, but I wasn't really sure whether having a clock was the right fit for the game. I generally try to avoid having non-diegetic UI like this. That's referring to UI that doesn't naturally fit into the game world. Something like a health bar, a dialogue box, or a timer, those are all non-diegetic. That's why when I made the flow system to communicate your speed, I didn't make it a visual bar that's going up or down, but instead it's the faint coloring that takes over the corners of your screen. So even though this clock was great for motivating speedrunners, it would kind of just always feel like this piece of slapped on UI. And it wasn't actually the most rewarding system. It's really easy to miss one jump and then feel like you already lost because you know that you need to get under a certain amount of time. More often than not, it's just this looming constant source of negative information as you play. So instead, I'm planning to rework that to give the player a visible amount of points that can only ever go up. A successful bounce out of a color will give you points, multiplied by maybe how fast you're going or how high you bounce and you build that score throughout the level. Each successful bounce is gonna have nice visual feedback of getting points, but you don't always see the total amount on screen. So even though the goal is still the same as it was with the timer, it's still speed, the UI is all communicating it in a way that's positive reinforcement instead of just demotivation. When I first started making games, I saw it as a pretty linear process. You come up with the idea, you make it, you do the art, the music, maybe you playtest it at the end, and then you release it. But that is just not how games are made. It is a truly iterative back and forth process, and I'm sure that that's what this video has shown. I'm really not that close to being done with this game, but there's still been so much testing. For all of the UI changes that I did, all the mechanic additions, that's how I landed on the real identity of this game and who I'm making it for. Unfortunately, it's now winter break and I'm a little deprived of anyone that I can harass to play my game. So I might I might end up calling upon you guys. If you're, you know, at all interested, uh, there's a Discord server in the description that I run. It's all around game development so you can get help with projects or try and assemble a team. And if I have any updates about playtesting for this game, I will post it in there. But for now, this is, you know, not a massive project. We'll see where it goes. I'm just having a good time with it. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye bye. Thank you.